double click on the okay looks good that, is it good yes okay let me explain briefly why i chose this title expectations in moving through the ranks in academia this is something that I have gone through, obviously. And uh, if this presentation could be of benefit to a couple people, I would say it's worth the effort. It's with that in mind that I selected this. I'm sure there are some distinguished individuals in your uh, ranks in here, but I will share my uh, experience and opinion on the subject. So I will move on through uh, through the slides. Can you also see me? I don't. Yes. I can see him. Yes, we can see him. We, we can see you. Okay. Let's see if I can forward, okay. Yeah. What ranks are we talking about? From assistant, in most cases, in most universities, you, you know, one starts with an assistant professor and then after five to six years, one is up for promotion to associate professor with tenure. And the next one is from associate professor to full professor. There is not a time frame for that, it could be Two years could be three years could be ten years or it will could it could never happen. It really depends, you know, on the achievements of the individual, which we will talk about. And then is endowed chair position, and this could be within the department or it could be within the college or the university. And finally, is to be elected fellow in your professional society. So those are the areas or the ranks, if you will, that one has to go through. And finally, there is obviously the uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Academy of uh, Engineering uh, and Medicine. And that has a different uh, evaluation process, but by and large, some of the things that I would mention in here will go through. What do people look for? What do your peers look for in the evaluation process? For junior faculty, it's really, you are looking five years. You are up for promotion after five years and the evaluation is done on the sixth year. So really in the first two years, you will be spending trying to understand the ropes, so, sp so speak. That is to get used to the area to define your, your research projects, to hire graduate students, to know, you know the department and so on and so forth. So the first two years is really a learning time. So you only have three years to produce something. So what the peers look in the evaluation process is the potential of the individual to succeed in his field. So really the key is this individual has a potential. So that's what they look at, what they look for. But for a senior faculty, the words that are commonly used are like that the individual should be distinguished in his field or in her field, that he is an authority in his field or her field, that he, he or she is nationally recognized by his research, by her research and has made an impact nationally. Those are the kind of words that they see in the evaluation process for a senior faculty. So the evaluation is really, you know, the college has uh, a say to the promotion of the individual. The university has a say to the promotion of the individual because they are hiring this individual for 40 plus years. So the evaluation process is very rigorous because once the person is tenured, he is in or she is in for 40 plus years. 
So that's why it has to go through all these processes. Okay, what are the expectations? I will categorize them into three categories. One is excellence in research. I will explain what that means. Excellence in teaching. And three, excellence in professional service. Okay, I lump everything into those three, into those three categories. And I will explain what each one of them involves. Here in most research institutions, a person may have a split appointment like certain percent teaching and certain percent research, or the individual could be 100% research or 100% teaching, or there could be an extension appointment as well. Administration is also considered if one is a department chair, there could be some 10% uh, commitment associated with administration. But by and large, it is either research, either teaching or research and teaching. In most cases, it is research and teaching. Uh, this slide is a little bit screwed up, so let me... Okay. What are the indicators of excellence in research? One is to develop a research program in the area higher and beyond. What does that mean? A research program, that is a very key, key uh, concept. It means it's a research where you have to go in depth and breadth. Not only depth, not only breadth, but both breadth and depth. If you have a lot of publications, but in different areas, then that's not really quite a research program. It has to be say, take Pan-Africanism, for example, you know? Well, there is the economic aspect of it. There is a the political aspect of it. There is the military aspect of it. There is even the psychological aspect of it. It has, it could have so many aspects of it where you can go, you know, in breadth and also in depth. Otherwise, if you publish papers in different areas, you may have a lot of them. That is not considered a research program. A research program has to have a thread that connects what you do. It has to have a theme of what you do. So that's extremely important. Another Element of this is publication in mainstream journals. I call it mainstream journals, journals that people know in your area, not in magazines and so on and so forth, but mainstream journals. People look your publications in mainstream journals. Another indicator of excellence is grants mansion. That's writing proposals and getting money for your research to support graduate students and also for your research. Well, when you write a proposal, you are writing on something new, on something new, and it's reviewed accordingly. What does this proposal provide new? Therefore, it is an indicator of excellence. If it is accepted, that shows you know, some elements of excellence in that proposal. Other indicators, invited talks in national and international conferences. Well, people don't invite an individual just for nothing. They must have seen something in that individual, something of value, something of benefit. That's why that individual is invited. Therefore, invited talks in national and international conferences are important. I'm saying invited, not just presenting papers, but invited talks. Another indicator, support and supervision of graduate students, especially PhD students, because PhD students are the students who bring new knowledge. Therefore, the support of, I'm not undermining uh, master's programs, but what people see especially is how many PhD students is he or she supporting and supervising. Another, another indicator is support and supervision of postdocs because the postdocs, they don't come 
for 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 a per they come for a purpose they know there's something good research going on in that laboratory that's why they come that's why they ask therefore supporting and supervising postdocs is also important and finally research awards i say here work at the interface of what this is especially important for junior faculty, even for senior faculty as well. That is, if you work at the interface of engineering and biology, why at the interface? That's where the excitement is, that's where innovation is, that's where breakthroughs occur. At the interface, you are bringing two, I'm saying that you have, I'm not saying that you have to know engineering and biology, engineering and medicine, but you collaborate with someone in, in a different area. Therefore, it's very, very logical to, to, to interface or to work with in, in engineering and biology, engineering and medicine, medicine or pharmacy and statistics. You see, people in medicine or pharmacy have a lot of data, really a lot of data. And people in statistics want real data they want to work with real data therefore it's very very logical and they have the tools like machine learning like deep data analytics and so on which others don't know or may, may not know therefore it is extremely you know beneficial to collaborate with somebody in a different field or what i'm saying is work at the interface of something engineering and economics for example, sociology and history, political science and history, and et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, working at the interface really is the area where excitement occurs, where breakthroughs occurs, where innovation occurs. So I really encourage you to work in, col in collaboration with somebody in a different field. And this association helps in that regard because you will be able to know people in different areas. Indicators of excellence in teaching. What do people look for? Teaching your courses well, of course. If you don't, the dean will know, the department chairman will definitely know because students speak. Development of new courses. This is new courses from scratch. That is considered to be very important because you are developing precisely a very new course. Teaching awards, teaching evaluations by students and peers, however subjective, people look at students' evaluations and peers' evaluations. So don't undermine them, however they are subjective. Observation during presentations in conferences. What that means is you are presenting papers at conferences and people listen to you and there might be people there who might be writing you letters. Therefore you observe people, yes, I saw him making presentations. He is that kind of person, he has that quality, that kind of attributes and so on and so forth. Therefore people do observe during presentations in conferences and also invited lectures in pedagogy. Similar like research, also in teaching, if you are invited to, if you are a good teacher, if you are bringing something new in your teaching pedagogy, others would like to hear about it and you will be invited for that. So that's important. Indicators of excellence in professional service. What do I mean by professional service? It's quite a list. One is undergraduate advising and mentoring. Well, undergraduate advising is part of the job responsibility anyways, but if you do a good job, students write about you. And mentoring is going beyond advising really. Service to the department, service to the college, service to the university, and service to your professional society. Those are also considered. Another indicator is participation in professional development workshops. I say professional developments like in leadership workshops, teaching and learning workshops, research workshops. This is just to improve yourself, 
in terms of teaching, in terms of research and so on and so forth. So those are considered to be important as well. Leadership in organizing conferences, seminars and workshops. I'm saying leadership here in organizing those. The point is you are bringing name to the institution you belong to. When you take a leadership role in something, you are bringing name to the department. You are bringing name to the university or to the college. That's how people see it. Finally, service, mentoring, advising, and leadership awards. Other indicators beyond research, beyond teaching, beyond professional service is chart a new research path beyond your PhD work. What does that mean? Well, you have done your PhD, you have done your dissertation on something. If you keep on continuing doing something similar, maybe, uh, yes, both in breadth and depth, but still the same area, then you are considered to be under the umbrella of your major professor. You are not out of it. So it's, it's, it's always good to chart, to chart a new research path of your own beyond your PhD work. I'm not saying that you have to abandon, continue on your, uh, on your PhD research, but I'm saying that you have to chart a new, a new territory, a new path. That shows scholarship. Otherwise, you are considered, hey, this individual is still under the umbrella of his major professor. He hasn't come out of his PhD work, even though he's doing good work uh, in that area. Other indicator is like research collaboration, no question about that, as a PI or as a co-PI with others in other fields. That's what I said when you work at the interface of two fields, that's when you become a co-PI with somebody else. I have worked with animal scientists, I have worked with genetics, I have worked with somebody in immunology and so on. So try to work with other fields. You have something to contribute, you have something to learn, and the other person has a similar agenda. First authorship in peer reviewed papers. All your papers should not be authored by graduate students only. You have to write papers yourself as well so that you are the first author in some of your papers. It shouldn't be all by graduate students. You have to show your own. Therefore, first authorship in some of your papers is important. People look at that. And if you can, be an adjunct professor in other fields. It could be in the same university. It could be in another university as well. Okay, about postdoc. Here I'm going to explain some of the uh, advantages and some of what I may call shortcomings of being a postdoc for so long. Well, working as a postdoc is excellent research experience for sure, because what you do is research only. Excellent grants writing experience, because that's what you do with a major professor produce many research publications, no question about that. People expect that because that's what you do. You are more or less 100% research. You know the literature well, yes. But I am telling you, use the postdoc position as a stepping stone to a faculty position rather than a career. Use it as a stepping stone to move on to a faculty position. I'll explain why. Don't make it a career. In spite of all the advantages I mentioned, use it as a stepping stone. More about working as a postdoc. Some of the, what I may call shortcomings. Well, no undergraduate student advising. Really, you don't have your own undergraduate students. You may advise undergraduate students of the major faculty whom we are working with, but not your own. No graduate student research supervision. You may supervise, but yet those are students of the major professor. 
no teaching experience. So I encourage people, even if you are a postdoc, 100% research, try to volunteer to do teaching. Volunteer yourself to teach once a while. You know, some people need help. They will, they will be more than happy to have you teach. It could be not a regular teaching, but at least as a guest lecturer sometimes. So have that, that experience because when, when, when you go to a faculty position, people will ask, well, he doesn't have any teaching experience. You don't want that. May not chart a new research path of your own. What does that mean? Well, you are working under a major professor as a postdoc. So really the research is his or hers, not your own. So you are not really charting a new research path. Regardless, even if you are the first author, that research is, belongs to the major professor. That's the way people perceive. And also working as a postdoc for a long time may delay in going through the ranks. If you are thinking of going to a faculty position, it may delay, so don't make it a career. I said it earlier, use it as a stepping stone. Salary differential compared to an academic position that we know. And there is no job security. It really depends, you know, postdoc, you are at the mercy of the grants. If money is there, you may continue working, but if the money dries out, then there is no job security. There is no tenure associated with it, as you know. And may delay settling down and building a family. What do I mean? Well, as a postdoc, you know, you have that a little insecurity and you are planning to go to the academic positions and you may not decide to get married or engaged or and, and so on. So that may delay, delay your, uh, you know, building a family. At least that's my, my opinion. How about working in industry? Should I work in industry and go to academia later? Or should I stay in industry altogether? You know, those questions I always get. Well, the research may be proprietary in industry, so you may not be able to publish them. Maybe not all of them. Therefore, you are handicapped there. Well, you get excellent design experience, no question about that. And you get better salary than in academia, but not job security. As you know, industry is after profit. If the profit dries out or if something happens, then you know what might happen. Excellent at the stepping stone to academia because you do have an excellent design experience. So when you come to academia, they like it because you can teach capstone design courses, desirable for teaching capstone design courses because you do have the experience. So if possible, if you are in academia, teach part-time, if possible, teach part-time. Volunteer to teach, if possible. All right, I'm getting to the end. Be mindful of the following. Networking with colleagues in your area of expertise. One of the objective of your association is, I guess, is networking because you have membership or people from in different fields. So that is really a plus. Networking, not only among Eritreans, but among others as well. Because at the end of the day, some of these people are going to write you letters. So have networking. I say second, identify people who know you well and have experience. This is important. People see you in conferences, people see you in workshops, people see you in seminars. Know some people really well, including Eritreans. I was a beneficiary of an Eritrean writing a letter for me for a full professor. He is not even in engineering, you see? Because the department may ask you names to give about five names who could write you letters. Because when you, up, when you are up for promotion, there is external review. People, about a dozen of them, a dozen of letters has to come to the department from ex externally. 
So the department send names or ask people out there to write you letters. And the department's asking you to give them four or five names and you choose names who, whom you think you know, people whom, who knows you well, people who can write good letters. So include editors. One I did and they asked him. I came to know later that he was asked. You see, therefore it has value. This networking both within and without from outside had its own value. Document your CV and promotion package professionally, thoroughly and convincingly. That's important because that's what people see. People, that's what people see in the department. That's what people see in the college. That's what people see in the university. And they send also your CV and some of your samples of your papers to external reviewers. So prepare it professionally, thoroughly and convincingly, and ask for an opinion for someone who has gone through it, you know? So in summary, I would say be the best you can be. You can't ask for more. We are mentors and role models of our children in the first place. When, when, when I, I can give you an example what, 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 what my son says about, you know, when you go to dad with 98% score on a test, dad would ask you what happens to the 2%. And I, I don't ask that, but what I ask is, is that the best you can, uh, you can make? If he tells me, yes, and that's it. If he comes with 70% or 60%, I ask the same question, is that the best you can do? If he says yes, then I accept it. If it isn't, well, what happens to the 40% or to the 30%? Next time, you got to work harder to be the best you can be. Well, this ends my presentation on this subject. I don't know how we are doing in terms of time. I can move on into something that I'm engaged in. Yeah, we, we, we still have some more time. You can, you can go ahead to. Okay, yes. I will move on then. It's a few yeah. slides only. This is, I am engaged in a new initiative in modernizing the agricultural food system in the continent, in Africa. This is to establish four or five technology innovation centers in the continent and to try to modernize agriculture and the food, starting from the soil, the plant, the animal, the food, cut it from soil to the supermarket or from the soil to the fork, if you will, looking at it holistically this is a multi-million dollar project and it is being sponsored by professional societies. So I am in the advisory board and I'm pushing some issues in there. So I'm going to share with you what my passion is. Why did I say that the next frontier is the continent? Look at Africa's endowment. First, you have seven or some people may say a billion strong people. And 70, 75% of those are young. There is biodiversity, all kinds. You have the land. Africa is really the sum of the US, Europe, China, and India. I paste, I paste those countries in the continent and it covers US, Europe, China, and India. So the land is there. The climate is there. Alternative energy sources are there. You have oil, you have precious metals, including diamonds. You have forest timber and livestock. 
So that's where I think the next frontier will be. But the key is to develop it. So the challenge, as I see them and others, water scarcity, energy deficit, and food insecurity. I would lump all those three in terms of technology and methodology that we have to change the technology or and the methodology to solve those problems, those challenges. Like any, like any other continent, there is a global climate change issue. You have infrastructure problems, lack of good governance or leadership, and that raises conflict. And finally, it's the human and institutional capacity. Call it education and research, if you will. Those are, there are, are obviously other challenges as well, but to me, those are the major challenges that I see. So in terms of building the capacity, you know, if you look, Africa's educational budget is very low, 0.3 to 0.5. So the scientific workforce has to grow. There is no ifs and buts about it. Therefore, investment in research has to grow. As you can see, Africa has 0.1%. Where are the developing nations greater than 3% of their GDP they spend on research? And the national research agenda should focus on multidisciplinary, multidimensional, collaborative, and problem solving. Problems today are not very narrow. It's multidimensional. It's multidisciplinary. That's why you need the collaboration. Therefore, it has to be approached that way. The research agenda has to be defined that way. And the money has to be made available for that kind of research agenda, for multidisciplinary, where people come together and propose multidisciplinary, multidimensional, collaborative research. So the, the focus should be on value, on impact. I'm not saying that research has to be done for research sake, true. But really for the continent to be developed, I think the value, the focus, the emphasis should be on impact, like poverty reduction, health needs, economic development, and national security, et cetera, and et cetera. And the educational system must also re reflect that multidisciplinary thinking, you know? It has to be transformed. Things has to be transformational to make a difference. Futuristic solutions in agriculture, specifically in agriculture, this is something that I am pushing passionately especially for countries like ours, which is very small in terms of the landscape, go vertical agriculture, vertical farming. Not only vegetables, vegetables for flowers, for animals and so on and so forth. Vertical farming, vertical agriculture. The land is, you see in the United States, they have the land, they can go horizontal, but countries that are small, need to go vertical. I have been in Japan once and I was taken to a place where there is three story building for chicken and another three story building for swine, pigs. When you come to the gate, you don't think that you are coming to a poultry farm or a swine or a pig farm. You think you are coming to a bank. It's so beautiful, it looks like a bank. Three story for pigs and three story for, 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 for chicken. When you come into the gate, they sterilize your car because they don't want you to come with bacteria for chickens, you know, because you have millions and millions of chickens in this building. And you come to the first floor, a big lounge, they show you videos how things operate. You see, since pigs are, housed by age or by weight, you know, some could be the third floor 
and some the second one the first floor and so on and so forth they move them by elevators the elevators are huge rooms and the waste the manure if you will goes through conveyor belts to another building dried mixed packed and sold you see so this is what i call vertical farming so we can grow our vegetables, we can grow our flowers, we can grow our spices. Okay, let's wait for animals housing, but at least for vegetables, flowers and crops go vertical. Air farming is another one without soil. How about ocean farming? We have the sea, such as seaweed for food and energy. Well, right now they grow seaweeds, but how about for food and also for energy, you see? Seaweed doesn't need fresh water or fertilizers. Yes, there are challenges. I don't know the solutions, but why not? Why not ocean farming? You see, who said that we are limited to the ground? Another challenge is perennial crops, multiple harvesting crops, you know? There are there are there are veget uh, vegetables now that 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 are perennial. They come back every every year. Even flowers, roses do. How about for crops? Can't we have perennial crops? I'm putting this as a challenge. And then precision or smart agriculture. What do I mean by that? There is a vertical farming. You see how tall it is? You can scale it with a guy on the floor. It's really big. This is in, in the Netherlands. And this grows with less water, 90% less water without soil. You bring the nutrients. So countries which has small landscape need to go vertical farming. What does precision or smart agriculture mean? That means going digital and everything is now going digital. You know, in this age of information technologies, where you improve productivity, profitability and sustainability, you go digital. You will have robots, for example, going elevators in hospitals go into your room, identify who you are, and give you the medicine you need. You see, you have robots milking cows and feeding cows. So there is now a shift from generalized management to a highly optimized, individualized, real-time and data-driven management. That's where the drones come in, you see? These drones will have their own algorithms, softwares, analyze data that comes from agriculture, that comes from medicine, that comes from other areas, analyze it and sell the information back to the consumer. So that's where we are heading. Sensors, drones, imaging, spectroscopy, the cloud, digital tools, robots, big data, GPS, GIS, automatic milking, feeding systems, etc., and so on. Today, you see, you can manage each cow, each crop individually. You will have data information for each crop, each potato, each tomato, or specialized crops especially, or each animal, when that the cow needs a mate. That's extremely important. The timing, to know when a cow needs a mate is extremely important that affects its milk production. Right now, what do they do? When another cow jumps on her, well, then you can't observe hundreds and thousands of cows. But if you put sensors, then you'll get that information on an individual basis. And then the farmer could go and do what he has to do or what she has to do, provide a mate, or artificially inseminate the cow. So we are going to a, from a generalized management to an individual, individual, individualized management and on real time. 
Here shows real-time continuous system monitoring. You can see the farmer there getting information from drones, you know, information about irrigation, information about the soil, information about the crop, information about the animals. Everything goes to the drones, analyzed. Unfortunately, these drones are owned by corporations. They take your data, analyze it, and sell it back to you, back to the farmer, to the end user. You see? So that's the trend. That's what's happening. OK. So thinking ahead, I'm almost done. We need to re-engineer the crops, animals, and other living systems at the genetic and it, cellular no. level. He's lecturing. You know? Oh, he's not lecturing. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. At, at the genetic and cellular level, so come sure. up with new crops. Yeah, and De can, development of efficient, smart, and self replicating. This is I what I said earlier. The chat works. Yeah, the chat works, yes. And develop tools and systems okay. for identification. Uh, they just put technician. For is somebody there? development of tools and systems for identification, tracking, mm -hmm. and monitoring. Humans, plants, animals. Okay. That's what I said earlier. At an level individual level. Face of the stress. Finally, my, my last slide is therefore. You meet uh, the, the presenter the, up. Please meet yourself, somebody. Yeah. I think if he sees it, he'll do it himself. Yeah. Can I yeah. go on? Send it. Send. How do you send it? Just press uh, send. Hello. Oh, send. Abdul, can you mute, please? Hit, hit that button here. Yeah. Oh, this one? Yeah. OK, go ahead, please. Sorry. OK, my last slide is then, this is just an idea, a proposal. Establishment of regional research centers of excellence. I'm, I'm, I'm talking the continent, regional research centers of excellence. Co-generation of knowledge meaning that it has to be collaborative with different south, between south and south. Right now, it's between north and south. There got to be collaboration between south and south, between among African countries. And there is know-how in the diaspora. So somehow, engagement of the diaspora's best minds should be thought about. You know, there are, four, Africa loses $4 billion per year for people who leave the country. Skills that leaves the country, $4 billion a year, if you Google it. Therefore, reverse or at least circulate brain drain. That's what China is doing now, trying to circulate the brain drain. At least they come and work in their country, they can still work overseas, but come and also work in their countries. One out of four doctors trading in Saharan Africa work in developing countries, imagine. You know, you spend money on this, this is only doctors. And I'm sure there are also others in other professions. Therefore, there got to be a way of engaging the diaspora's best minds in the development of the country. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Kufle. Uh, it's now open for questions. If you have any questions, you can type them on the chat space or you can raise your hand and I'll call you. I have a question. This is Mahari. Okay, go ahead, Mahari. Uh, uh, so, Dr. Fly, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think I have one question for you. Uh, one of our goal at this association is to uh, uh, to produce journal 
articles, uh, what we call ES, uh, ESJ, Eritrean Studies Journal. How do you think that this journal might help to uh, impact or allow those young faculties to develop their scholarly uh, contributions through this young journal or even new journal, you may call it. Uh, any thoughts, suggestions on, because the engagement part is one of the big challenges that we might have to bring young faculty into the, uh, both the association and contributing to the, uh, to the journal. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, one thing I would suggest is you have this seminar series. I would have one seminar dedicated where the membership speaks for four to five minutes explaining their research, you know, what they do, so that the rest would know who is doing what. So if I want to collaborate, you know, I know whom to talk to. So that in itself will generate interest. That interest hopefully will translate into publications. And uh, since your publication is peer reviewed, then it has value. People will see that it has value because that will help them in their profession because peer reviewed. And, and really, if you do an excellent job in, you know, at, especially at the beginning, people see the quality of the work, the quality of the journal. Uh, I don't think there is anything else to, to be done. You know, have them participate in seminars like this, as I said, create some sort of collaboration. You know, I'm still collaborating with people, you know, and there are some distinguished people I know, Eritreans. I don't know if, you know, uh, Professor uh, Aforke Maasho is in the audience, I don't know. He's an immunologist. And I know two really powerful immunologists himself and somebody in Stony Brook, Rana Gabriel. So if people start collaborating and pu start publishing together, I think it will take off. Okay, any other question? I, I have a second one, if you allow me. Okay, this is Mahar ahead. again. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Fly, another question is, maybe I'm wrong, but I think most senior faculties, uh, Eritreans in particular, uh, who are at their higher level of uh, academic excellence, they come to help the uh, research or anything related to homeland, which you might call it brain gain, late in the game. Um, I might be, you know, I don't have statistics, but that's, that's my, my, my thought and belief. If you think that is the case, you know, how could young faculties or even senior faculties could accelerate in connecting to, you know, to, if we call it homeland, uh, could be a trail or could be anything that is within the context of uh, this smaller uh, association in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer for that because it really depends on the individual's commitment, uh, time, and priorities, uh, and also willingness on both sides to engage or to be engaged, you know. Uh, I found this initiative that I'm in is continental. And for example, when it comes to selecting research hubs, the innovation research hubs, 
you know, it makes you wonder who should be, which countries should be the candidates, you know? Obviously it will be very difficult to select Eritrea as a hub for this innovation hub because the number of farmers are small compared to other places. Therefore, you wouldn't have a chance. But since it is regional, you know, you try to help so that people know about it uh, and participate and try to get the know-how. We are still on the stage of forming the research hubs. So I don't exactly know what shape and form they will have. Um, well, that is through indirect, very continental. It's not directly to the homeland, as, as you said, but the homeland depends on so many factors, you know, willingness from both sides. Um, the opportunity should be there. The willingness should be there and so on. Otherwise the skill is, there is enough skill, enough expertise and even once you are, you know, you don't have a teaching and the research commitment in an institution, you have time, you know, to contribute. So I don't exactly know uh, to give you, you know, uh, solutions, but your, your thinking is as good as mine. I have a question. Mm. What do you think are the major challenges in creating these uh, centers of excellence in, in Africa? The, the money or governments, or what do you think is the, the, the biggest challenge? Well, the biggest challenge, um, we don't expect the challenge because we are going to involve the government to some extent. We are going to involve industry, you know, entrepreneurs, because whatever innovation you created, then somebody has to fabricate it. There is human resource development part of it. There is institutional development part of it. There is entrepreneurship part of it. It's not only innovation. It's not only physical, technical innovations. It's methodology, technology, human resource development, and we are targeting the youth and junior faculties, extension agents, farmers, and so on. I would only get hands up So So I don't know what challenge we'll face, but the beauty of it is it's co generation. It's not people with expertise going from here and tell them what to do. You know, the expertise will be partly from, from within, over there. They are the ones who are going to do the job. We may provide ideas. That's why we call it co-generation in terms of ideas. Co-generation in terms of human resource and institutional development. So we are trying to change, you know, the traditional mode of operandi, if you will, going from there, we know better, you do this or you do that. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, thank you. And the I, have, yeah. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. It's not even a question, it's a comment. <clears throat> so I like this presentation, it's beautiful, it's good, and it can help a lot of young, uh, potential professors and all that. My, and it's high level, I love it, it's good. My worry is not about this type of people, this type of community, even though they need help, they need advising from older uh, professionals and all that. What bothers me most is the other 95% of the Eritrean people uh, who are migrating here and, you know, uh, and you can see they are they have a lot of challenges, a lot of language problem, cultural problem, and all this. So my question is, if there any effort uh, 
uh, <clears throat> is there any effort happening to help this group of people? Because those are the ones more, I wouldn't say danger, but they need more help. But these professionals, they just need a boost or more, you know, more high level uh, advising. But uh, how about the other people who don't have all this access or background and all that? How can we help those people? How can we, what can we do about them? Because you can see them, they are just struggling, you know? Is there any effort going on somewhere that I don't know? But it bothers me more and you know, I, I always wonder, you know. I really appreciate the question because it's very pertinent uh, because you are talking the 98% or the 95% who need right. help. I can only appreciate the question and also sympathize with the, with the agony. Um, I don't know of any organized uh, form to address that particular question, which I know of. Um, but that problem exists and will exist. <laughs> so I don't know what to tell you other than I agree completely. Yeah. I, 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 I think I can say this. That is very, very important thing but this association is not doing anything to that. We might invite some, somebody, would be very happy to invite somebody who's doing that kind of work to talk to us, but as a group, as an association, we are not involved in any, uh, anything like that. We are solely interested in, I, I mean, the, 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 we, we really, understand the plight of our people and the young people who are going through all these bad things these days, but the, this association is not organized to deal with that kind of uh, problem in Eritrea. This is, this aim is specific and its goals are the, the, the stuff I just showed you before. But if you know anybody, there are people who are doing their best to help in that kind of, for, for example, I know some groups who help refugees in, Yemen, in Libya, in Ethiopia, and things like that. And I would love to invite anyone who's doing that kind of work to come talk to us, but as a group, we are not doing any, any kind of work in, in that field. Yeah, okay, I, th I get it. So yeah. the mission is different. That's not our yes. goal. Uh, that's not right. in an opposite way, but that's, you know, we yeah, are the, 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 This was organized for a specific purpose. Right, right. Yeah. We are, we are sticking to that. But, yeah. but, but I, I know a lot of people are doing that kind of work with uh, refugees and things like that. And as, in, as Eritreans, we'd like to help them and disseminate the, the, whatever good they are doing and make people know about them and talk to them in. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the, uh, one thing that I want to add to this is Mahari. I think the opportunity that this organization, this association, or, or the journal is going to give to this is some scholars could write a scientific peer reviewed scientific findings about this particular issue that you're talking about, which is, which in, in my opinion, you know. I, I was not able to read comprehensively through a well-written scholar of this big, big issue. So maybe it will open if there are scholars of interest to write journal articles or even grow their scholarly uh, endeavors in, in addressing you know, some of this, this uh, uh, issues that you're bringing. So that could be like a, a good research problem with the research question that could drive scholars to develop their, uh, you know, their scholastic uh, route. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dasale has a question. Go ahead, Dasale. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, first, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Kaflai. Uh, this is very, uh, helpful information um the, the helpful information that he shares with us it's uh 
very valuable to me. Thank you so much. I have two questions if you have time. One question is, um, you said that like Africa is endowed with immense uh, natural and human resources. Of course, great culture, you know, ecological and economical diversity. That's important. But the main problem is we suffer from dictatorships, you know, corruption and then civil unrest and war, of course. So do you think so there is a hope these things can be changed? I don't know in what maybe in the long run, possibly, but I don't know, within our <laughs> lifespan. So I'm just uh, I'm just curious about that. The the second question is um, this is for the tenure and promotion. So let's say you got research service and teaching. So we can check this one, you know, you can perform well in all the three categories or other categories. But there are some politics uh, involved, you know, it could be from the department, college, and then it goes to the provost office. So how do you play those politics? So what is the best way to approach them? I will start with the second question. Uh, there might be elements. I would say that there is a lot of politics in academia. There is, There might be elements, but I tell you, in the evaluation process, since it goes from external review to the department, from the department to the college, and the college creates its own committee and looks at what comes from the department, what comes from external. And from there, it goes to the university and the university has a vested interest because they are, as I said, they are hiring you for 40 plus years. So they don't want to load the university with tenured faculty, you know? So they have vested interest, so they create a committee and the committee looks at what the college said, what the department said, what the external letters uh, show. So there are checks and balances, if you will, along the road, you know? So the politics is very, very min minimal. In my opinion, the university is a place where at least there is, there is some justice to it by and large, some guesses to it. So I wouldn't really worry about small politics, you know, unless one person wants to make a stupid of himself or herself and try to argue otherwise, I think there is enough data, there is enough information coming from external reviews from within and so on. So that at the end of the day, you know, uh, justice will prevail. The second question is, I don't know, so, so difficult to, to answer. Uh, I hope the only thing I tell you is, yes, I hope it happens in your lifetime or in my lifetime. That challenge, I mentioned it at the end, you know, is part of the challenge that the continent faces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Brahani, you can go ahead. Dr. Brani, uh, unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. Okay, I think it's not there. Okay, Tesfamika uh, Johannes, please go ahead, ask your question. Okay, well, thank you. I, first of all, uh, thank you, Ramas, uh, and thank you, Professor Kifai. I am absolutely a true student here. I am you know, not a teacher, uh, but I'm a civil servant. Anyway, I did, I, just a curiosity, I you know, have been reading and, and uh, listening to a lot of debate, at least in this country, in regards to tenure. Uh, as you know, uh, I, you know, I was a civil servant and uh, the civil service, once you got your civil service tenure, nobody will question your uh, your position and you got a lot of a lot of uh, laws to help you to protect your profession. Um, but at the same time, during my profession, I do see a lot of a um, lot of people who are not absolutely no good merit, but still keep their position. My point is this: I mean. Now there's a lot of debate about tenure. What do you think? 
in regards to this uh, tenure. And uh, once you got position, it's for life. Uh, and people, some people may not be, may, ex may not excel uh, to their profession after they got the tenure. Thank you. Yes, there is that element uh, of it, but not very much. Uh, that person will remain an associate professor without being promoted to a full professor otherwise. Um, so there is that uh, stigma, if you will, that this guy or has been an associate professor for so long, you know? Therefore, there is pressure you know, uh, pressure to yourself, pressure to the profession, pressure to the, you know, to from the university and so on. So otherwise you will retire as an associate professor. Uh, of course, for assistant professor, if you don't get tenure, you are out. And that is a very bad stigma, even if you go somewhere else, because people ask, why did he leave this university or that university? Uh, so, uh, there, there, is, there is pressure, you know. Uh, I do it for myself, I do it for my kids, I do it for my career. Uh, so people tend to work hard, you know, uh, even once they get tenure. The problem that universities are having or are, you know, debating is that they don't want to feel the university with tenured people. Now they have come with uh, what they call uh, clinical professorial positions. That is people without tenure. They can promote them to associate. They can promote them to full professor, but without tenure, you see? The reason that they promote them is, well, first they deserve it. Second, you know, they can bring more money grants if they are promoted you know, because of their stature. So they have come with this tricky way, if you will, you know, to promote people, but without tenure. So that debate is there. And of course the candidate would not like it because, you know, uh, you are there without tenure, even though you may be an associate professor or a full professor and so on. And the reason for tenure is not to guarantee your job only. That's not the philosophy or the reason behind it. If you are tenured, then there is no one looking really over your shoulder. You can debate, you can uh, do whatever uh, research you want to do and so on and so forth without being worried about somebody you know, telling you one way or the other. You know, so it's good for the institution, it's good for the students uh, that that person has tenure because the debate flourishes that way. Because if someone has no tenure, there is that psychological impact that you have to think twice or be careful otherwise. So it's very important to the institution itself. So it's not simply uh, granting tenure for the individual so that he has or she has a secure job. It's important for the institution. Okay. Uh, Dr. Brahane, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, it's very impressive, uh, Professor Kaflai, for the presentation. I really uh, I learned a lot and uh, particularly the fact that you presented uh, the way uh, Africa has been, uh, you know, endowed with all God-given uh, every everything in every aspect, actually. Uh, so we hope that we can be able to use it uh, in the near future. I would say, although at this time it's not, it may not be feasible. But I'm very happy also that you are at least doing some kind of activity, like you mentioned it in uh, in Sudan. But my question is, uh, uh, did you get a chance to, maybe I came late, uh, and this is also my first time to attend this uh, seminar, which is very impressive again. Uh, did you get a, any chance to work in, in Eritrea? I mean, uh, in our uh, 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 back home. Uh, 
Uh, and if not, uh, do you have, uh, for example, like, you know, things change, which we hope uh, in the very near future uh, that you could be able to implement all these uh, lofty ideas that you were presenting that were probably also working in other sectors or that we could be able to implement back home and help uh, our, uh, our people. And so, so, so the question in short is, did you get any chance uh, until now? And second, if, we, if not, do you have like, you know, some prepared uh, projects that you can implement immediately uh, if things improve? Thank you. Uh, I guess yes and no. No, because it's not enough. Yes, yes, I have been doing small things. I did visit all the dams um, as an engineer, trying to figure out, you know, their capacity and what it means. How many harvests can you harvest with that amount of water? Uh, is for security possible and so on. So I did some calculations. I even made some presentations in a few cities here in the United States. Um, uh, so that kind of, you know, small work. Uh, but I wouldn't say, you know, enough because one always thinks that you could do more. Uh, partly because, you know, in academia, you know, we work 12 months a year because it's research and teaching. Even when students are gone, you still have the research. So that doesn't provide you enough time to, to move. Um, I did participate in a couple of conferences, yes. Uh, that's about it. What about for the future? In case things change, do you have some prepared, already ready-made project that you can implement very uh, quickly? <laughs> no, no, not ready-made. You know, uh, it's not an individual's, uh, you know, activity. It's it, it takes a village. Uh, you know, it takes the wisdom, it takes the capacity and the know-how of people like yourself and others uh, to do you know, significant things. Yes, individuals can contribute, but I think it requires uh, the efforts of a lot of people to, to, to make it transformational and impactful. So we'll see. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Any more? I guess one thing I forgot at the beginning is I didn't get your permission to wear a hat. I think I'm hiding something. <laughs> and I put my picture, I put my picture on the first slide to show the young ones that I had hair once <laughs> on my head. So I apologize for wearing a hat your in hat my looks presentation. Good. No problem. And if, if there are not any more questions, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Kufly for a wonderful presentation today. Thank you so much, Dr. Kufly. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Much. Thank you. And we will we'll, uh, post the, the video on YouTube in a few days. And thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And hopefully, we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. Bye. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you.